In a stark contrast to most of the videos in this channel over the last week, we've actually got some good news to bring, and that is that Activision have uh, basically been beaten into making some change. Yep, their back is firmly up against the wall when it comes to how they treat employees at long last, and finally we've got some progress. Yep, so this of course is in the backdrop of all the bullshit that happened, mm-hmm. and of course the recent, you know, funky union stuff, which we will certainly get into because it is a part of this, yep. um, but for the main bit of news, they've made 1,100 game testers full-time employees. Now the hope for, you know, us as people who play these products is that this will eventually lead to better products, right? So that's that's one of the hopes. Also, it's nice to know that the people involved in making the games that we play are being treated a bit better. So yep. they say they have ambitious plans for the future and our QAT members are critical uh, for our development efforts. Uh, of course, it's quite funny. That's only something they recognize whenever they get called out. You know, <laughs> how it tends to go. Uh, so they have announced the conversion of all US-based temp and contingent QA members at Activision Publishing and Blizzard, nearly 1,100 people in total, to permanent full-time employees starting July 1st, and they are increasing the minimum hourly rate to $20 an hour or more effective uh, April 19th. Yep. So that is a fairly large change. It's interesting that, well, it's not interesting, it's pretty obvious that they always could have afforded to do this. They just chose yeah. not to in the past. Yeah, it's um, like they're, they're doing they're, this. <laughs> yeah. They're choosing I mean, the thing that actually makes sense long-term for their business. Yeah, which is obviously, like you say, in stark contrast to how they usually operate. So I think, like, there's a little bit of this is recent them seeing, like, uh, Call of Duty kind of fall over and go, okay, this is definitely a problem. Um, I know Warzone has ha- constantly been haunted by cheats and bugs and stuff, all of which is kind of, I'm not sure, too sure about the cheating part, but bugs at least, that's what QA are there to catch. QA are there to catch those, send them back up the chain. If some part of that chain is not being efficient, then your games are going to be worse. You're going to be climbed on and people will just go to other products. So it's like, especially with it, like Warzone 2 coming up in uh, this year, the next year, I can't remember which, but whenever that project launches, it needs to be like, this is beautiful. There's no bugs. This is fine. So it's like, I think they finally recognize that this is like a super important part, but also that I imagine this is literally the more effective uh, thing anyway, because happier employees, better employees, but also how much money does it take to constantly spin through contractors and have to deal with all the legal stuff and all that? This is likely yeah. just going... Why why are we making this a problem for ourselves? We'll just just throw money at the problem and do it properly and it'll go away. Yeah. Another point of this too is like the the insurance and stuff. Yeah. In the American context, this is fairly massive. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. I mean, a, a very simple thing. Recently, I went to the doctor. Mm-hmm. I got a nasal spray and one or two other things to mm-hmm. make some chronic sinusitis go away. Mm-hmm. If this if I was in the states, actually no, even if I had health insurance in the states, I think that would still be one of the things you got to pay for yeah. because of, oh my God, that's so weird. Um, but for a lot of these people in QA, it's like even run of the mill, like just you know, random health issues just happen yeah. to crop up. Like they often end up living in a bit of a state of fear that anything could happen because it is so goddamn expensive. You know, like I, I even remember the, it was the last time actually, you know, two times ago that I was in the States. Um, one of the guys that I was with just like got an infected cut mm-hmm. in a toe. And in my head, I was like, okay, I know exactly what to do. Like, yeah. here's the three things you need because it had happened to me ages ago. Mm-hmm. Instead of that, he was like, oh, no, I should go and see the doctor. Mm-hmm. And it was just like, you know, bam. It's the sort of thing that you deal with in, you know, two or three days here completely for free. So expensive. Mm-hmm. And if you think about it for these QA staff, like, it's all these basics of life that for them are going to be the most challenging. Yeah. And they're not yeah. getting insurance. And unfortunately, yes, yeah, sure, they'll they'll get their insurance here. But uh, I suppose the minimums or whatever mean that a lot of those day-to-day things that, that cost them bother won't get covered. So I, I felt like I was about to make a decently strong point <laughs> yeah. about how this is a really good quality of life increase for these 1,100 people. Mm. And then I realized, like, deductibles and shit. Uh, who the hell knows? But overall, this is going to be really good for people's peace of mind. And I guess it's the lack of stability. Um mm. I think health insurance is just the obvious one to talk about, given it's yeah. fairly important. Um, like over here, these things are obviously less of a concern because of the way that things are set up. Yeah. Um, but over there, it's like people are going to feel well and truly like on their own. Definitely. You know, yeah. very unsupported. Like there is no safety net. And I imagine. I imagine that just causes a hell of a lot of, you know, head and, and heartache for these people. Yeah. Which now. 
is significantly reduced. And that is really good. Yeah, and that's where you get into like the pay part as well, where generally speaking, you know, you think about the trade-off, you go, okay, well, Activision aren't paying for my insurance because I'm not an employee. Surely that means they can pay me more to make up for that. And that's kind mm. of a trade-off that uh, things. I know people kind of do that here as well. But it's like, no, that's not, that's no, because they've just been paid worse because they've gotten away with being paid less. So now in addition to having the safety net of, oh, yeah, you've got a bit of insurance, you've got pay time off if something goes wrong and you don't have uh, problems there, you know, you've got, uh, etc. Extra money will just mean now you, you're probably living above the bread line now which means you can actually have a safety net monetarily, which they clearly didn't have before. I saw some people talk about like um, like cost of living in certain places for Activision. And it's like now they're going up to $20 an hour. That's basically like, I think it's, uh, I think it was Minnesota is where a lot of uh, certain Activision publishing QA are. And that was basically like double the uh, minimum wage there. And you're like, okay, that's a, that's a pretty big step up for them then. Yeah, so overall, it will essentially help people get out of a poverty trap situation. Yeah, which and is, <laughs> obviously, when you're working in QA and video games, uh, you know, obviously it starts off relatively lower skilled, but you very quickly skill up really, really, like, strongly there. Then that's, like, that's that's the high skill position. What are you getting paid minimum wage for? That's clearly just corporate greed doing that. Yeah, exactly. And I, I think, I think Bobby's bonus getting bigger at the expense of yeah. all of the actual freedom that these people have because being in that situation is is not freedom. Yeah. Like that's I think quite obviously a corrupt perversion of the American dream. Of course, right? Yeah. So <laughs> Actually, yeah, that's that's one that, that, that's, that's why you have to hammer the big companies who are just doing, you know, corporatism. Yeah. Right? <laughs> that's a very good point because remember the last couple times Activision Blizzard reported like record profits and record uh, revenue and stuff and they always coincided with tons of layoffs. Because they were just, they felt they were, they were on the ball. Like, oh, what can we do with all this money? Fire loads of people and then pay the lawyers to make the problem go away. So now it's like, they are clearly, I mean, obviously they're not in any trouble money-wise. They're still making so much. But with like Vanguard kind of falling over and them dropping a bunch of their expectations. As well as like the Blizzard side not doing all that well. Maybe there's a little bit of future outlook they're thinking about here. But it's, it's the case of, oh, Activision Blizzard, not really doing all that well. But they still have the money for this now. Kind of puts the fact that they've like how they behaved in the past under a different light. Yeah, absolutely. It 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 shows the past is exactly what we all thought it was. <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, and you know, it's like oh, record profits. Good thing barely any of our employees seem to have good stock options. Yeah. So yeah, sucks. Now, as for the why here, mm -hmm. well, number one, it will make games better immediately and far in the future. So this yep. is from Josh, who is a Activision publishing uh, COO. During the last two years, Call of Duty has expanded and evolved. Development cycles have gone from an annual release to an always-on model. In response to greater engagement, we've seen our live services, or we've increased our live service uh, business across all platforms, uh, you know, grown our workforce and all of that. But in light of these, um, you know, they look at ambitious plans, blah, 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 and basically just saying QA continues to be really critical to this. And I think that's just a overly verbose uh very corporate -y way of saying we're doing live services it's really important that our <laughs> operational capacity is there yeah obviously this is important especially if you're a, a warzone yeah. player and you know what that game has yeah. been like which is actually interesting because you think about the live service model versus an annual release model and you think well one of the big problems that games have had is the over reliance on contractors the stuff we talked about with the 343 and stuff where it's okay you're done pre-production you suddenly need an extra 300 employees for like a year and then that year ends and you don't need them anymore so obviously like the the quick and dirty answer to that is just contracting same goes for qa we're like well you don't need qa when you don't have a product to test but then you're like oh we need all of our product tested very quickly get a bunch of qa contractors in so the live service model actually is kind of better for them because there's basically always work for them to do always something to be testing on like a grand scale and i think that's kind of where the, the kind of what he's sort of saying here is just yeah, we literally just need to treat you more importantly now. Whoops. Yeah. Also for them, it takes off legal and PR pressure. So that's yep. an obvious win for them. And of course, quite importantly, it is a powerful anti-union move. <laughs> yep. Indeed. Uh, and there's like a few ways where you could say this. Uh, I mean, one of them is whenever people are being treated really, really well. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's none of the bullshit that there will be, you know, less of a perceived need to like, you know, create a union or whatever. Yeah. So that's like uh, one side yeah. from the business. Activision but then the other thing. side is this as a direct uh you know response to union activity going yeah on. yeah that's the thing where if they'd done this like a year or two years ago no one would have called a union busting 
but now they're doing it at the same time union stuff's happening and then everyone's going oh no you're you're now trying to be our friend because we caught you out for not being our friend and now you're kind of you know going, oh sorry we were we were we were good the whole time we promise yeah so if you remember the situation with raven qa where a bunch of them got yeah. converted to full time some of them didn't though that led mm-hmm. to strike action and all of that well, there's these Raven QA uh, employees. They're employees, but they're not getting the bump to uh, mm-hmm. the minimum of $20 an hour. Yep. And the framing is, you know, sorry, we can't change your pay because of union stuff. Which is legally true, by the way. But yeah. <laughs> uh, So it's quite interesting with the timing. Now, the CWA are saying that it's a very clear move to convince staff that a direct line with Activision is better than getting into bed with a union. Mm -hmm. So here's a bit of an email from the president of Raven saying, through direct dialogue with each other, that's the important bit, direct Mm -hmm. dialogue, uh, we improve pay, expanded benefits, and provided professional opportunities to attract and retain the world's best uh, talent. But then going on, Due to our legal obligations under the National Labor Relations Act, we are prohibited from making, uh, you know, new kinds of compensation uh, changes at this time. Yep, the Raven staff, and that's tricky because, as, as far as we can tell, that's true. Oh yeah, no, that's well, done with the yeah. Li- union. Yeah, later on, um, Activision do respond saying, you know, uh, well, CWA has a response, and Activision goes, "No, here's literally the line in the law. Here's where in this legal stuff." This is literally true. Yeah, so CWA told The Verge, make no mistake, all credit for this latest move to give all temporary and contingent QA workers full-time should go to the workers who have been organizing, mobilizing, and speaking out. It goes on to say, the company's assertion that the National Labor Relations Act prevents them from including Raven workers is clearly an effort to divide workers and undermine their effort to form a union. They're calling it a disingenuous uh, announcement that's further, further evidence, basically, of... Uh, you know, why they should join their union. Because yep. obviously the union is going to have an incentive to grow its own numbers. <laughs> yeah. The more than the more power the union has. Mm-hmm. Well, what Blizzard or Activision Blizzard says back to this is, the union's assertion is both wrong and disingenuous. It is well known that during an election petition period, the law prevents an employer from extending new kinds of benefits to employees who are going to be uh, voting. They say, see National Labor Relations Board v. Parts Exchange Co. Uh, and associated yeah. cases for discussion of the rules. The CWA is blaming us for trying to compare Apply with the law by pretending the law doesn't exist. It's really fun to read this because the way, because CWA never said that Activision were lying about that. They only said it's disingenuous. They're asserting this, which is basically to say that CWA are looking at the same and go, oh, you're saying, you're like very clearly in your argument blaming this on the union stuff. Like, oh, sorry, you're in talks with the union. You don't get the money, which is literally true. But then you think like they could have said, you know, we were intending to imply this to Raven, but we can't at this time. We will once union negotiations are over, regardless of the outcome. That's what they could say and brush it all under the under the rug. But they are just kind of going, eh. oh man, you'd have so much more money if you just didn't think of it being in the union. Oh, Aren't you pity. sad about that? <laughs> yeah. And it's sort of tricky because if you're going to yeah. sort of try to get real with this in a way, mm. um, look, if you're management at Activision Blizzard, do you want all your employees in a union? Hell no. You don't. (laughs) Like, we we just... Here's the thing. We have to engage with the different incentives of different people here. And sometimes you have this problem on the internet where engaging with that is mistaken for agreeing with that. And that's not the case. But basically, if you're Activision Blizzard, yeah, you don't want people joining a union. It is literally not in your best interest. Mm -hmm. Now, you could then say that the union employees will be happier employees that will be better taken care of, that therefore will do better work, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, But I think for those Activision Blizzard, you know, top people, they're going to see that and think, well, that's a lot of ifs and maybes and also a lot of power that can be wielded against us. Mm -hmm. Then you're like, how about we just give them the shit they want? Cut a union out of the picture completely. We still, you know, they are happy because they've had improvements in working conditions and we still have the direct line and all the power. Yeah. And then if you're an employee who is benefiting from that, you're obviously going to see less need to join that union because, you know, what's one of the reasons why there is union? So you can have collective bargaining for better workplace conditions. If you already have those workplace conditions, then the literal, this union is a solution to the problem I'm experiencing. That is there less. Therefore, there's less incentive to join the union. A union, of course, is going to grow and become more powerful, uh, like, you know, literally in terms of money that they get from union fees, uh, political power that they get from, you know, memberships, you know, voting and all that shit. 
So the union just, well, yeah, it's going to want to grow. So these are just two large organizations batting heads a bit. Yeah. Um, generally speaking, one of these organizations is set up to be better for the worker. Uh, well, I guess that's even the tricky thing. In a very exactly, ideal yeah. scenario, Activision Blizzard makes the most money by treating their employees the best so that they do really good work. Hmm. And then for the union, well, the argument is collective bargaining and all of that. That's actually what's best for the employee. So I suppose it ends up being a can we not have both uh, thing. Um, and then I, I suppose it's probably just wrapped up in a whole bunch of like legal red tape and sludge that makes everything really slow and annoying. Yeah, that's why I think the way it's actually basically unfolded is all of these employees are like, we're going to go join a union. And Activision are like, hmm, are they, uh, is this is this all, is this, is this a game? Is this bit? Should we take this bit? Are they going to? Yeah. How, you know, almost how, uh, like how loose can we let our grip on our employees leash before they don't want to leave? And that's kind of, that's where I think like the existing kind of collective power is kind of worked where just like, no, this is bullshit. So if employees continue shouting, this is bullshit, then Activision will have to give it up a little bit. Yeah. So it's a case of, you know, should they continue going for the union stuff? Obviously it's impossible to say how that would go out because obviously Activision Blizzard have a lot of uh, tactics they can uh, pull for specific situations like this. And it's just like really complicated, like you say, a really complicated like uh, crisscross of different incentives and different uh, wants and needs and stuff. Uh, it's really hard to know. It's just yeah. it's just great that I think that now people are getting a little bit more aware that they they do have this this kind of gun they can point at the company they're working for. Or like, no, we, we will literally, like this is going, this may not be the best for us, but you're going to hit it too. So sort us out. Yeah, uh, it's kind of fun that it's actually working out well, and I really hope this is the thing. I really hope that like in a year or so, maybe maybe it'll take maybe eighteen months for these like the effects of these changes to go through. But wouldn't it be great if the next couple of Call of Duties and the next couple of Blizzard games release with so much less bugs and everyone in the industry can just go? Yeah, that's how the they deal. How, pay employees more, give them time off, they do better work. If only this was in any of the business management books that currently exist. <laughs> oh, dear. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's it. It's, it's kind of weird because the, the correct uh, strategic move from Blizzard would have been, or Activision Blizzard, hmm. would have been to do this ages ago. Yeah. Get, that, that's, yeah. that's the, like, weird thing. Hmm. And I suppose it's probably this, like, weird, fear-driven, kind of, like, defensive, sort of conservative business leadership. I don't yeah. say conservative as a political thing. I mean, like, you know, literally. <laughs> yeah. Um, because you could always, I think you could always see that something like this situation was going to happen. Mm -hmm. So it's like, when you see that first domino fall, what do you do? Do you realize what's going to happen if you just let them keep on falling? Mm -hmm. Or do you try to fight against the flow or something? No, what you do is you, you know, you, you take the decisive action. Yeah. If they had seen all of the issues that a company was facing and just started doing moves like mm -hmm. this, proactively where they you know it didn't look like they were basically being beaten into doing it yeah then they would have had control over the narrative they would have been providing these better working conditions for their employees we all know that this like this was a how efficient is this operation problem mm -hmm. uh this was this is not something where they financially needed to do it yeah i mean because they can do this just fine in a year where they don't have the big record profits, which I think is quite funny <laughs> when you think about how they previously were doing all the, you know, a whole bunch of cost cutting yeah. during years with record profits. Yep, indeed. Um, so I suppose it's just mm. that weird thing. That yeah. like weird anti-human, you know, spiting your future self to have better numbers right now. Hmm. Real, just fucking seemingly stupid corporate America. Yeah, that's, that's what the past seems to have been. Yeah, and it's and obviously it's very yeah. strange. Yeah, it's how the like. Hopefully, there's a little bit of a more future-led outlook. And honestly, that's where I think it's interesting. Where you know the record profits, they do all this bad shit to try and get more money, but now they sort of lose their grip on the top a little bit, or feel like they're not invincible, and now they see themselves as like, oh shit, we can be killed. Oh, we need to defend ourselves. I think that's kind of what's kind of happening a little bit. Yeah. 
maybe it, and hopefully that's ultimately for the best like it just screams of me of a leadership team that is looking at all those numbers you know that's very much kind of doing all that top down stuff but really seemingly completely without an understanding of the front line of their own company oh, because if i think about the black ops games yeah i think it's like 3 and 4 both had very ambitious plans for a campaign that had to be axed, completely butchered yeah. to make launch. Yeah, because I remember 3's was really, really interesting, but felt the barren, and then 4's just didn't exist, right? Yeah. Yeah, no, I remember Connell telling me basically a whole bunch of things within Call of Duty yeah. where the really big ambitious plan had to be slaughtered. Hmm. And the amount of, you know, because they have had a few misses in that franchise yeah. that are seemingly just down to the way that they were cracking the whip at these teams. Hmm. You almost see some similar things with Blizzard. And yeah, it definitely. just screams to me of these business leaders who are seeing the incoming cash. They're seeing all of all of these things. And, you know, they're almost at the very top trying to balance their numbers on the computer, you mm. know, yeah, to like, hyper-optimize these things. But without, without much of a, a deep understanding of the actual inputs that go into those numbers. And I think that's what's just made so many of the Activision Blizzard like big decisions over the last like bunch of years so baffling. And it's really felt like they've succeeded in spite of themselves. Because when you certainly look at the Call of Duty franchise, like how many times does it seem like Activision have almost killed Call of Duty? Because like it, <laughs> sure, <laughs> almost it just sells year. all the time. Yeah. But when you kind of look into the leaks and the rumors about the development of some of these titles, when you look at the studios that they've ran through, when you look at the com- companies like Toys for Bob, mm. who have lost yeah. so many fucking staff, yeah. who create staff like were there for games. one project and did not want to be in Call of Duty Land forever, it just seems like Activision succeeded in spite of itself because, a, you know, there's there's a saying. Is it Charlie Munger? I think it might be Charlie Munger. Mm. Um, it's like the other half of Berkshire Hathaway. Uh, you know, it's not about how hard you row. It's about the boat you're in mm. often, right? Mm. And it just feels like a bunch of people, Bobby Kotick, found themselves in the right boat. Yeah, they got the right people. That, mm. Yeah, they, they found themselves in the right boat with the right people. Funny enough, that's Vince Sampella and Frank West. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Oh, God. Who, you know, are now gone. Yep. And it's like from that, just by being in that boat, Mm -hmm. they've had all of that success. Yeah. But is it because of Mr. Kotick and his leadership team having excellent leadership qualities? Obviously fucking not. I mean, no, okay, right. No offense to Bobby, but we've heard Mm. things about him, about his, you know, care of legacy and ego and pride. It's like, Bobby, you're the least fucking inspiring leader I've ever seen. I've watched you in CNBC. We've seen the fucking videos mm. where you are there flatly talking to a teleprompter really slow. You know, it's like somebody just said, Barack Obama talks slowly and that means people listen to him. And Bobby <laughs> just thought, ah, okay, I'll do that. And he didn't think about any of how you actually fucking yeah, deliver words. Like moving his face. <laughs> yeah, even like that. So it's like, how much of the success is, is down mm. to Mr. Kotick? I think it's it's down to acquisitions the company made and riding off the coattails of far more capable people. Yeah, I mean, it isn't... While being it, yeah. basically asleep at the wheel, and when you fucking wake up, you're just taking the whip and damaging your own teams. Yeah, I mean, not to go not to go full on seize the means of production, but it is, like that's the kind of thing you're feeling, where Bobby put the money in, and then the people turned his money into more into more money. Obviously, there's some leadership stuff going on there in terms of, like, you know, that money is his in the first place. There's other stuff to do with, like, you know, he did actually, you know, get the company and hire the people, and that's all, like, part of making stuff. But it's definitely the case where games are made by the people who make games. Pe- games aren't made by the people who make decisions at the top level. It's like everyone in that chain has their part to play. And when that's not, when the rewards aren't balanced, then you have this case where, the like, the product is not coming out as good. And you've got them going, well, we're going to go to Union because we don't feel like we're getting rewarded for the work we're doing. And that's the thing where that is definitely changing in some places and definitely changing for the better. A lot of like games have been... Actually, uh, Lego Star Wars is one of the best examples recently. That game is incredible by most accounts. People love the shit out of it. It's broke the last Lego uh, record on Steam by 1,200%. It peaked at like 82,000 players on Steam. And that released a couple, I think it was five years development total, three complete restarts, complete restart on the engine and severe crunch and bullying that was reported on. And it's like, how did they make that? 
it was it was <laughs> the people making it made that despite all the bullshit. Yeah. And they're likely not going to get the reward for it, even though the game is like the best Lego game ever made. People are calling it Lego May Cry because the like the melee combat is yep. so well I can't done. Believe that. Yeah. It I yeah, I remember playing Lego Lord of the Rings. Mm. Which I think I actually disappeared from Steam because of licensing stuff. Mm. And I remember just being taken away with how charming yep. and nice that game was and how much I even though it, you know, in the face of it wouldn't be my thing. Yeah. So I'm probably gonna check that game out. Which, same, yeah, same. I'm yeah. fortunate that it seems like it was a shitty thing to make. That's a that's that's a moral quandary I've had to deal with this week because I really want to play that based on all the reviews. But it's like, eh, how much am I supporting the developers versus how much am I supporting the leadership team of the developers? Damn, awkward. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yep, yeah. No, it's it's tricky. So look, that's the situation mm-hmm. here with Activision. Uh, overall. The, the most important thing here is that 1,100 people uh, or nearly 1,100 people have just seen a large increase, mm-hmm. uh, you know, we would hope anyway, uh, to their overall, like their compensation, their quality of life. Hopefully that will mean that these people are, you know, going to suffer less from all the sorts of things mm-hmm. that a terrible work situation, um, you know, amplifies. So good luck to them. There's two more of this happening in the industry because whenever these employees are treated better and have better rights better you know holidays when they don't feel like one illness could essentially destroy their life from a financial perspective etc mm-hmm. uh, they're going to do better work and even as a purely self-interested gamer that's going to make your games better yep. that's why that's important yeah i mean <laughs> think of it this way right so the the worst part of video games today are um oh so let, let, let's say monetization aside because that's pretty bad people might say that's the worst one of the worst parts of technical video games being made is that so many of them come out buggy broken not working right i think a lot of people would agree on that then you look at you know which department is treated the worst which department is paid the less the least which department is relying on contractors instead of actual employees qa obviously correlation is not causation but wouldn't it be fun as a, an experiment with the industry to go, all right, let's treat QAs like humans and see if the QA problem goes away? I am I would put my money on yes. Yeah, I think so. So that's <laughs> it for today's video. Good news, things for us to be aware of. I hope you found this to be interesting. I hope that you and me get better games as time goes on Definitely. because of this. And uh, with that, there's more content on the channel, so check it out. And we'll see you next time.